Welcome to the Clements Bookworm. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clements Library. This is our 21st episode. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please note that we will be recording this session to share later. And you, if you're new, will receive um, an email later today with the resources mentioned, as well as a link to the recording. Just a couple of notes to, um, you know, a little mini tutorial. Please continue to chime in in the chat section. It's great to hear from you all and feel that sense of camaraderie. We miss seeing you in person. Select all panelists and, and attendees so that we can all join in the conversation together. But you will notice that the conversation goes by very quickly. So if you have a question for our panelists, please put that in the Q and A section. There you can type your questions. You can also read the questions that other people are asking. And if you give it a thumbs up, that will upvote that question and help sort the queue. In addition, if you have comments or answers related to somebody's question, you can comment on that question and it'll, it will all stay together. My colleagues, Ann Bennington Helber and Tracy Palevich will be helping out in the chat, posting links and answering questions. So thanks so much, Ann and Tracy. In addition, depending on your device, when we are in side-by-side -side mode like this, you can decide how much of the screen you want to see for the, um, the slides, and where you want the speaker to be. So play around with that a little bit and slide it around. That doesn't hurt anybody else's view of it. And I only have so much control over what you see uh, because everybody has different devices. We have panelists today who will be speaking um, together. So you may also want to change your settings from speaker view to gallery view so you can see everyone. It's fine to leave it on speaker view. It will just switch back and forth between the person who's speaking. Um, but if you'd rather see everybody, you can hit gallery view and then it just highlights whoever's speaking. Um, I feel like they're, oh, the transcription. As part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion plan, we do have the auto transcription turned on today. If you find that distracting, you can toggle that off. So uh, you can change your settings and toggle that off. All right, if you have any other questions, um, you can always put them in chat to Ann or Tracy. Uh, but thanks for being here. This program is brought to you by the Clements Library on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. Thanks so much for joining us. I see that we've had a lot of people take our poll I'll give you one more second to quick click and tell us which of these first got you interested in American history. If you joined us early, you heard us talking a little bit about some of, some of the things that got us interested. And um, I'll go ahead and end the polling now and share the results. All right. 50% said a book or book series, which doesn't surprise me at all since we're on the Clements bookworm. And um, mm -hmm. it's nice to see how many teachers are inspiring people to be interested in history as well. So 35%, 41% um, a visit to a museum or historic site, a relative or family history, 35%. Um, and Wow, two people even said the Clemens Library. So thank you for that. So um, thanks for participating in our poll today.
I'm excited to welcome three doctoral students um, studying American history to the program today. Uh, our panelists will be talking about their experience and sharing their work. So first, I'll welcome Jonathan Quint. Jonathan received his BA and MA degrees from the University of Windsor and has presented his research at conferences in Canada and the United States. Jonathan's dissertation project explores how the ordinary people of the Detroit River region experienced the imposition of the U.S.-Canadian border in 1796 and the subsequent efforts of the American and British authorities to harden and police the border. His work charts the ebbs and flows of cross-border movement and exchange among the region's diverse population of French, British, and American settlers and indigenous polity. He is a 2021 uh, Eisenberg Institute graduate re student research fellow. And during the fall semester, we are excited to welcome him to the Clements Library for an internship funded through the LSA History Department and with the proceeds from the Clements Library Associates Board of Governors Internship Endowed Fund. So Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, hi everyone, thanks Angela for having me too. Um, I can talk a little bit about my work, um, how the resources that I'm using at the Clements and a little bit about my experiences at the Clements. Um, if you'd be willing to go to the next slide, uh, oh, um, can I introduce the other two oh, people first? Sure, sure. <laughs> I just don't want to get away from the slide quite yet. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right, but we're excited to hear hear about your work as much as you are excited to tell about it. Yeah. Um, Great. Zachary Copen, uh, welcome. And uh, Zach is a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan Department of History as well, and received his undergraduate degrees in history and music, respectively, from the Honors College at American University in 2014, as well as graduate certificates in museum studies and African American and diasporic studies from the University of Michigan in 2016. A former race law and history fellow with U of M Law, also Mellon Public Humanities Fellow and U.S. Society for Intellectual History Henry F. May Award recipient, as well as also being a current Eisenberg Institute Graduate Student Fellow. Zach's research focuses on the ways in which people of color influenced legal development in North America before the turn of the 20th century. Welcome, Zach. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Next, we have Hunter Harris. Hunter received his BA from the University of Oxford and his MA from the University of Chicago. He came to Michigan in 2013 as a PhD student in the Department of History. Right now, Hunter is finishing up his dissertation titled, When Trust Fails, Merchants, Law, and the British Empire in the 18th Century which he plans to defend in the next month or two. His research examines how merchants around the British world interacted with law and how the law structured empire. So thanks so much for joining us, Hunter. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about everyone's decision to pursue a PhD in history at the University of Michigan. So I'm excited to hear more about what influenced you. Um, first up, let's see, do you wanna, what do we have first? I think, I think first, this is, this is Jonathan's slide, right? Yes, yes. Okay, but I was going to ask Hunter first <laughs> about what influenced him. So I'm going to turn off my screen share for a minute and ask Hunter. Sure. So um, when I was applying to graduate schools, this, can you all hear me? I'm not sure. It's yep. Working. Yep. Oh, great. So when I was applying to graduate school, I knew that I wanted to work on uh, 
the British world and trade and merchants and issues related to that. And I was familiar with David Hancock's work about British merchants in the 18th century. And so I read his books and thought he would be a really good person to supervise my work. And so I applied here to Michigan. Um, that's what led me uh, to the doctoral program here. That's so great. Um, and so you're working with David right now. Right? That's correct. Yeah, David's my supervisor. Excellent. And um, I think Tracy is going to uh, paste in to chat a couple of those books that that you read. Um, so if people haven't checked those out yet, they're really great. All right, Zach, how about you? What led you to Michigan to do a PhD? Um, I uh, was trying to figure out what to do after undergrad and my advisor handed me a list of grad schools and said apply here. Uh, and it ended <laughs> up being one of the greatest instances of serendipity in my life. Um, at the time I was working on a project on black sailors in the early US Navy um, and coming here to work with David Hancock and also a scholar who was here at the time, uh, Martha Jones, um, was really great, um, sort of picked up the project and move it into other questions about politics and law, um, sort of larger questions about American uh, legal development and political development. Um, and it's really worked out well and it's great to, great to be in Ann Arbor. Great, that's lovely. Um, we haven't publicized our fall programming yet, but uh, Martha Jones is, is part of our virtual programming in the fall and one of our wonderful Clements Library Associate Board members. All right, Jonathan, now we're ready to hear about your research. Yeah, so like Zach and Hunt, oh, okay, about my research. Um, so I thought, I just have three slides prepared, which I thought I can use as just prompts to guide my conversation and really just introduce everyone to my work. Um, this is an image of the Detroit River. Uh, you can see Detroit very clearly in the middle, uh, and then Belle Isle to the right. Um, one of the first uh, maps generated in Detroit's period of English colonization, which began in 1760. Uh, I'll add really quickly that in 1701, Detroit was first settled by uh, French colonists, and that's really the beginning of European settlement in this region. So this, this map was generated around 1764 to essentially allow British authorities to see, to view this new territory that had been acquired. Um, I'll add that this map is available through the Clements Library Image Bank. It's been digitized and it's really one of my favorites. Um, I use it basically to chart the scale of agricultural development in Detroit, see how farms had expanded outside the walls of this initial fort, which again you can see in the, the middle of the image here. Um, I can also add that my work continues, it begins around 1760, continues through the War of 1812, and really in the middle of that is 1796 in the creation of the U.S. Canadian border in this region. So the image that we're seeing now, Detroit and its suburbs and smaller surrounding communities are, are one really holistic unit. It's all functioning together. Um, but in 1796, when the border comes through, there's obviously division there. So my work considers what were the consequences of the creation of the border for really a really multicultural population of French, French-speaking habitants, uh, English merchants largely, Native American populations, which were of course resident in this region for, for centuries. Uh, and then later, of course, in 1796, American authorities and American settlers coming in wanting to Americanize Detroit and America, Americanize Michigan and essentially uh, develop through territory and then statehood process. So my work examines how ordinary or let's say lower class individuals are experiencing this progress. So they could be clerks, they could be farmers, they could be rope makers, um, they could be gunsmiths. Those types of trades and professions are what I'm interested in and how those individuals are responding to the creation of the border uh, around 1796. So again, I, I, you could move to the next slide, um, but again, I'd really recommend um, the Clements Library Image Bank, which has these wonderful digitized resources of early Detroit and early Michigan. Thank you, and tell us and, a little bit about this. Sure, this is a depiction of Detroit from 1804, um, viewed from the Canadian side. This, uh, the building in the foreground is uh, now a Catholic church, but originally established as a Jesuit mission um, 
for Huron populations, Huron Native American populations of the Great Lakes. So this is just a, one of the early depictions, the illustrated depictions of Detroit, um, albeit from the Canadian side. Um, and you can really get a sense for just how small the settlement was around 1804. And I think as well, what's important is what it looked like before the 1805 Great Fire, which really devastated 99% um, of structures in Detroit. So it's an early, it's an important snapshot of, of Detroit pre-Great Fire. Yeah. And again, you can, you can see this image through the Clements Library at Image Bank. Thanks, Jonathan. I, sure. I skipped over asking you what led you to Michigan as, as a PhD student. Sure. Sure. Well, I actually grew up uh, in Windsor, Windsor, Ontario, so just across from Detroit, and I had always been interested in uh, local history, um, the early history of colonial Detroit and Windsor. Um, and it was, a, I think, a lot of what drew me to, to the topic and what drew me to Michigan was, first off, the subject matter is in a way local. So there's the Clements has wonderful resources on early Detroit, early Michigan. It's a great repository. Um, there's also great libraries through the Detroit Public Library System that have research material. Um, but like Zach and Hunter, Michigan came really highly recommended. We all, I work with David Hancock and I also work with Gregory Dowd uh, in American culture. So really wonderful collection of advisors um, and the reputation of the department certainly uh, were big draws bringing me to Michigan. Thank you, thanks. And I know that you and I and the, um, when we were doing the dress rehearsal, talked a little bit about how even now this border between Michigan and Canada is sometimes a little blurry where, where it's hard to understand sometimes why it's so hard to go back and forth when you're so close. Right, right. And I also consider questions of, um, these ordinary individuals, you know, what would encourage them to, as the board is created in 1796, residents of Detroit are given a choice whether they want to retain their British subjecthood and go to Canada or whether they could remain in Detroit and become American citizens. So as this border is being created, there's also this citizenship question. So I'm, I'm considering what are the factors that, that are influencing individuals to, to you know, remain British subjects or become uh, American citizens. So it's another one of my important questions. Thank you, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, Zach, we'd love to, to hear about your research interests as well. Yeah, so I think it's the next slide is me. Maybe it's two more. Yeah, oh. that's, that's John, so one more. Oh, sorry, Jonathan, do you want <laughs> no to worries. talk about this one? This I just thought I'd include, it's, a, it's another resource that's available through the Clements Image Bank. It's from 1817 and uh, it's just a wonderful example of an early map of, of Michigan and the lack of really no awareness of, of the geography of the peninsulas and the Great Lakes generally. Thank you. All right, here we go. Um, so I am writing a dissertation on the development of law in colonial New England with a particular attention to Clements Colony. Um, this is uh, one of the few items in the Clements collection that have anything to do with that. Uh, it just wasn't something that Clements and his friends were interested in collecting. They were more interested in the 18th century and American Revolution. Um, but this is a particularly important document um, to people who study colonial New England because this is John Smith's map or a copy of John Smith's map of New England from 1616. Um, yes, that John Smith from Pocahontas. Um, after uh, he went through everything in Virginia, uh, he took another voyage, went up the coast of North America and produced this map. Um, this map was uh, used by a lot of settlers, fishermen, people who were going to the George's banks just off the coast of uh, New England to get codfish. Um, but it also struck, uh, struck some people in Holland who were separatists, uh, who we now know as the Pilgrims. Um, they went to John Smith. They asked him to help them settle North America. Uh, they said he was too immoral uh, after some conversation. He wanted too much money. And he said, uh, they're not going to know how hard of an exercise this is until they get beaten with their own rod. That's the words he uses, beaten with their own rod. Um, of course, the first winter comes and, and they get wiped out. So. Um, 
it's uh, it's a particularly important document. Um, I'm sort of working on a couple decades after this. The legal records don't begin until the 1630s. Um, but basically, I'm doing old school social history. I'm going in, I'm counting stuff, trying to figure out how the legal system operated um, and what influence it might have had on the development of common law in, in North America. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. And Hunter. Thanks. So um, my dissertation looks at British merchants in three different parts of the British world. And so uh, what I've done is I've picked a city in each region of the empire. So I look at New York in the American colonies, uh, Glasgow in Britain, and then Calcutta in India. And I look in each city how merchants interacted with the different patterns of trade and the different legal systems and the different social structures in each city to produce um, an institutional structure that worked for them and let them kind of get on with their business and found a way to make the law work um, for their needs. Um, I picked out a couple of nice maps of each of the three cities that I wanted to show just because I really like them and they give a little bit of an idea of how each of these places is very different. So this first map is um, of New York. Uh, this is the southern tip of Manhattan. And it was made just after the English conquest in 1664. Um, and you can just see what a small place it is, how important the river and the harbor is to the community and how it's all oriented towards um, oceanic trade. And it's just you know, a, tall, a small settlement at the tip of Manhattan Island. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. This came out a little blurry, but this is a depiction of Glasgow in the early 18th century. And already we can see that it's a much more developed city. Um, it has a couple big prominent churches. We can see steeples. There's a big bridge over the river. It has a university and a really well-built um, and articulated social structure and community. And so Glaswegians think about themselves very differently and have a sense of communal pride that's a little bit different than how merchants in the North American colonies think of themselves. And then if we can go to the last slide, please. Um, this is a depiction of Calcutta in the later 18th century. And right away, we can see that this place looks very different than anywhere in North America or in Britain. Um, at this stage, Britons are building these kind of large neoclassical palaces for themselves and for their public buildings, but um, as the foreground of this picture shows, it's populated with people and animals and colorful textiles that are all very foreign to um, the Atlantic world and to British people. And so Calcutta is much uh, more diverse, polyglot, polyconfessional community where the way in which English law fits is a lot more complicated and it poses a challenge for merchants and jurists there. Um, most of my research has been done in archives in Britain, New York, and in India, but I have used the Clements a little bit. Um, and on the next slide, I have a picture of one of the Taylor papers. Um, the t John Taylor was a Scotsman from the Lowlands who got sent out to work as a factor in Virginia, I believe in the um, late 1760s, early 1770s. Um, Glasgow was very prominent in the tobacco trade. And he spent the next several decades uh, trying to amass a fortune working in the colonies in the West Indies. And he wrote a lot of letters back to his family uh, and business associates in Glasgow. So I've used some of those um, in my own research. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, it's, it's um, how, how much time did you spend in, uh, in each of the cities? How, how much time to research? So I spent... Um, I'm trying to, I spent three months in Kolkata in India, um, three months in Glasgow, plus some time in Edinburgh, another several months in London, um, and maybe about six months in New York, and some time in Albany, where the state archives of New York are. So the project's quite literally taken me all over. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I just want to note uh, for anyone who's new to the bookworm that uh, last week's episode, uh, very heavily featured the Taylor papers. So if you're interested in more about that, um, I just recommend checking, checking that episode out with Daniel Lipsick. 
Yeah, I think Dan actually did the uh, first cataloging of the Taylor papers. That's yes, because. exactly. He did. He did indeed. So, all right. And Zach? Oh, this yeah, is not for, the, for this, right? This is for your next answer? Well, this is for my discoveries at the Clements. Okay. Is that, yeah. But I, um, yeah, so I'm ready for discoveries at the Clements. You're right. Discoveries at the Clements, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I spent about two years um, on behalf of a scholar in Australia, a woman by the name of Lisa Ford, if you're interested in her, in her books. Uh, the big one is called Settler Sovereignty, which is a comparative study between New South, New South Wales and Georgia as penal colonies. Um, there's no more group uh, angrier at the Americans for revolting than the people in New South Wales uh, because they got sent to Australia um, as the newer penal colony. So anyways, she was working on uh, Native Americans in the colonial legal system, and she was particularly interested in the development of the proclamation line of uh, uh, following the Seven Years War that was supposedly going to prevent American and Anglo settlers for moving across the Appalachian Mountains into what we now call the Midwest. Um, so she paid me to read through the entirety of the Gage Papers, um, which is something like 189 volumes. It's quite large and each volume is about this thick. So it's quite a lot of papers. Um, and in the picture here, we have uh, the unboxing, the literal unboxing of the Gage Papers from General Gage's trunks. Um, so in reading all of those, I found a couple of interesting things. Uh, the first of which uh, is the receipt uh, that the people tried in the Boston Massacre trial, so the British soldiers, sent to General Gage to try to get some of their expenses reimbursed. And one of the items they asked uh, to be reimbursed were gifts for the people of Boston, um, which are bribes. And I always thought it was really interesting to submit a receipt to try to get reimbursed for the bribes you gave out. Um, the other thing that I found really interesting about reading all of these uh, documents um, was that General Gage is, who at that point is the commanding general of uh, British forces in North America, is far more concerned with the French settlers in uh, the Midwest, in modern day Illinois, um, concerned about their revolting uh, from British rule um, than he is about the uh, riots in Boston. Um, and there are a number of instances in which he has the opportunity to send British troops uh, to the Illinois country or to send them to Boston, and he chooses to send them to the Illinois country. And that's a very different way of thinking about um, British Empire, uh, control, how to maintain borders and order, um, than we are traditionally uh, uh, taught to think about it in the American school system, right? We think about all the action of the 1770s happening on the, happening on the coastline, and in reality, it was quite different. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, Hunter, do you have any any favorites from the, the Clements? You know, so I um, haven't spent a ton of time working in the Clements uh, on my own dissertations that I mentioned the Taylor papers. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of odds and ends left uh, in my archival research that are at the Clements that I kind of saved until last that I was hoping to get through this summer, uh, which I haven't had a chance to do. So whenever you guys open back up, I'll probably be first in line to look through my list of of assorted letters that I want to get to. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I'm sure that that it never occurred to you that that everything would get shut down. So exactly, um, I, I left the the archive closest to home for last, thinking it would be exactly. the easiest. Look how that's worked out for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, happily, we do have some staff back in back in the office working on some cataloging and some digitizing, and then we'll have to see. We've got some plans moving forward with the university, so we'll we'll see how it all goes. But fingers crossed for you. Thanks, <laughs> um, Jonathan. Do you have some favorites at the Clements? Sure, um, I have a few because quite a bit of my um, quite a bit of my research relies on Clements materials. But um, one of my favorite, it's just more of a kind of an episode and historical episode, but James Sterling, who was one of the uh, early British merchants who arrived in Detroit, there's a wonderful letter book of his by uh, at the Clements that documents those early years, early 1760s of the fur trade in Detroit. Uh, and there's 
this letter that he's writing to a friend and he's describing how Sterling had to find basically a rented room in, in an older French lady's apartment or home in Detroit. And he's re recounting to his friend these kind of verbal disputes and arguments that he's had with his landlord saying, I just want, you know, I want to take down some of her shelves so I have room to store my bundles of fur. Um, and I don't, you know, that episode just really stuck with me. Uh, I haven't had disputes with my own landlords or anything like that. But just seeing these so ordinary, so routine events, um, you know, in these individuals lives and, you know, how it was such an important event for him that he had to write to his friend about it. Um, those those kinds of minor episodes I, I really enjoy coming across. And then there's also, um, you know, another huge collection similar to the Gage papers is the Clinton papers involving the American Revolution. Um, so there's a lot there on the American Revolution, as Zach mentioned. And if you've seen the Patriot, it's a lot of material generated during that time. So there's questions, you know, the ability to, on one hand, see Hollywood's portrayal or depiction of this event, and then to go read it for yourself, I think was, was interesting. Um, and, and I did that work as a uh, research assistant for a professor here. So that's what brought me to the Clements on that, uh, on that occasion. Nice, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I know we were talking about this a little bit at the beginning, um, but there are so many great books out there and um, I'd love to hear about some of your recent reads or, or books that have inspired you. Um. Sure. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go first for this one. Um, at the moment, I'm reading a book called The Death of a Notary by Don Merrick. And it's this really beautiful, evocative micro history of um, a man who worked as a notary in Albany, New York at the end of the 17th century and his struggle and confusion of coming to terms with the transition from Dutch to English rule and finding that in this new uh, legal and government system, notary just isn't so important and how he um, at attempts to navigate that, that transition. But it's, um, it's written very much in history's literature style. Um, so it's a really beautiful book. Uh, I'd recommend it. Thanks. How about you, Zach? Uh, so one book I always recommend is um, What George Washington Had for Breakfast, which is about a 20-page children's book. Um, but it gives a really good detail, uh, detailed example of the historical process and the way in which historians uh, ask questions, reassess questions, um, come to answers. Uh, in this case, the, the child thought um, George Washington had boiled, uh, boiled liver because it was easy to chew with his wooden teeth. Um, and then you come to your final answer after asking for some help from an educated librarian. So that's always a good life lesson, right? Um, the answer is pancakes, if anybody wants to know. Um, but in the more adult vein, um, I am currently reading This Land with Their Land uh, by uh, David Silverman. Um, it's a book about uh, the history of, of the Wampanoag Indians, who are the Native Americans in the Thanksgiving story, um, and how they dealt with expansion of uh, the British imperial system in North America, um, as well as their struggles with the American government about gaining recognition, um, which at this point they still do not have. So uh, it's quite a good read and I would uh, highly recommend it to anybody who's interested in that topic. Thank you, thanks. How about you, Jonathan? What have you been reading? So the last book I had read, um, coincidentally, it's a speaker who's also going to be presenting next week at a, at a Clements Bookworm event. Uh, his name is Guillaume Teasdale. Uh, it's called Fruits of The Fruits of Perseverance, The French Presence in the Detroit River Region. And it, it's similar to my work. Uh, it's focusing uh, more so on the French as opposed to the British, but it really looks at the origins of French settlement in and around Detroit and continuity throughout the British period of colonization and then through the later American period. Um, looks for evidence of French culture in the landscape and the history of the region and, and considers how, um, especially how French settlers really transformed the landscape of the region as well. Thank you, thanks. Yes, I hope everybody will join, you, join us again next week for that great conversation too. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think one of the burning questions that people probably have is what is it like being a graduate student during the pandemic? Um, this, this time is a challenge for everybody, but um, you know, we'd like to hear 
specifically what what kinds of challenges you all are facing. Um, so maybe Zach, would you like to go first? Yeah, so I was out in Boston this spring doing research um, and I was out to dinner uh, with my girlfriend on her birthday. She had come to visit and we got a text alert on our phone that said uh, the archives and everything else in the city was shutting down. Uh, so we decided to get out of Dodge. Um, so I was supposed to be spending this summer uh, doing research in Europe, uh, the spring doing research in New England, and then the fall doing research in New England. And of course that all has been stopped. Um, lucky enough, uh, some of the stuff I need is online. It was published in the 19th century. So those documents um, are available, um, but they're not the manuscripts. So you miss the, the cross outs and the edits and the, the funny notes the clerk writes in the sideline. Um, and those are all sort of important historical uh, things to assess. So it's, uh, it's not been, been great. Um, and the other problem is that a lot of us depend on the grants that we get for money. <laughs> um, <laughs> so with no research, no grant money, no grant money. Uh, I'm living back with my parents right now. So um, it's, uh, it hasn't been easy, but things are moving forward and hopefully archives are developing some uh, procedures to move forward. So looking to get back into the, the library soon. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. How about you, Jonathan? Uh, I think I would definitely, definitely echo what Zach was saying. I had some plans for research that were interrupted as well, not the same locations. I was thinking Chicago, uh, Kentucky, places in Canada as well. Um, but yeah, those, those closing has been definitely a serious obstacle. There's ongoing discussions in, you know, our history department, and I think all, all departments across all universities about, um, you know, how that's going to affect us, um, you know, in our, our time to completion. Um, but, you know, again, I was also able to convert to or pivot to digital stuff and online stuff. Um, it's really just not the same. Um, it's, you know, it's a matter of sitting in front of a computer all day, hitting next on a microfilm. It's just not as, even as enjoyable um, as, you know, reading, having the physical documents in front of us. So I, again, I'm really looking forward to libraries and archives opening up again soon. That'll be, that'll be really, really nice. Let us get back to the actual stuff of, of history and what we, what we do. Right. Thank you. Thanks. So Hunter, you're you're lucky to be a little bit further along, but I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Fortuitously, fortuitously, most of my archival research is done. Um, but the pandemic has slowed me down because I need, you know, with libraries shut, it's hard to get access to um, a lot of books. Thankfully, the emergency online access has made it possible to get through to get to some things, but still not everything is on there. And you know, the process that we're so all accustomed to reading a, a book on paper and being able to skim through the pages, doing that on a computer um, has taken some adjustment. On the flip side, um, with Hathi Trust and the other um, online programs for reading, you can word search a book. So when I'm looking for one minor little detail, it's easier now to see if it's included or not, and I can move on and get to the next item. Right, right, so everybody has to, just, just like us with, pivoting our um, online programs, we all have to learn some, some new skills and, you know, figure out how to make it work. And it's, you know, it's all definitely not the same, but it does have some upside that when we can use both, we might, you know, continue with some of, some of the, the tricks that we've learned. So you all mentioned um, looking at the research in person and Zach touched on this a little bit about why is it, especially when you're, you're doing such detailed scholarly research, why is it that you need to see the items in person? I mean, I, th for, I think, for, yeah, go ahead, Hunter. No, go ahead, Sorry. good. So I think, Speaking for myself, my project has changed a little bit and I was originally looking at a lot of merchants ledgers. Um, so I would become familiar with the individual's handwriting. I would become familiar with, you know, the actual work itself. It could be, these ledger books could be hundred pages. They range widely. I think it's a question of going through seeing marginalia that's been added, seeing the additions that have been made, small notes that have possibly been added on a later date to describe this transaction or what happened. Um, there's random kind of unique, on some pages there'll be a drawing. Maybe the merchant or the merchant's son felt like 
practicing their script or practicing their illustration techniques. These kind of really hyper personal elements, um, I find really, you know, they just come into relief when you have the document in front of you, the book in front of you, and you can see um, see clearly. And I, I feel there's a more tangible connection there when you're actually holding the ledger and could be computing it, uh, putting it all, you know, organizing all the data. Um, yeah, those are things I enjoy much more than next on a microfilm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, uh, it's certainly much, much easier to read things on paper, especially when the handwriting might not be so good or the ink is faded or the paper is fading. Um, having the physical item makes the process of research a lot easier. And then there's still that that process of kind of fortuitous discovery, seeing what's next to what, and you know the way things are arranged. Um, it, it all, you know, I think it goes so much better when you have the the physical the physical items. And and you also get a sense of the size um, that how these documents must have been handled, how they were taken care of. Um, what might have been going on around those documents. So if you have a particularly large letter book, um, you need a large desk and you need to do other things with it. Um, and that changes how you understand the context in which these documents were written. Um, and may, it's different writing on a campaign desk uh, in the field than it is writing uh, in a merchant's office in uh, Glasgow um, and how those affect the quality of the paper and all those other things. So um, using the physical documents, you know, it, it can also give you some context beyond the words. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the other thing is, if you're researching in person, you get to talk to the librarians in a way that you can't uh, <laughs> uh, at home or looking on microfilm. Um, and the Clements is pretty blatant about this. They have a tea hour uh, every day. Um, but other places, you know, you bring the, the archivist coffee and they let you see the original documents and they don't let most other people see. And um, it's just a, a good way of getting extra knowledge that you can't just by reading a document at home. Yeah, so one of the things when we set this program up, we were thinking about tea time and some of those conversations that, that we've all enjoyed and how much we learn from each other. Um, so that was one of, one of the ideas behind, behind the bookworm was, was tea time. And so many times researchers talk to either the curators or each other and discover materials oftentimes in a different division than they were looking in. So you might be looking in manuscripts and then somebody says, oh, there's a map too that you should look at. Um, which I think is always, it's always fun to be in the room when that happens. <laughs> so thank you. Well, hopefully we'll all get a chance to get back in the archives soon. Um, it looks like we have a lot of questions um, ready for us. So I think what I'll do is go ahead and um, wrap up my last couple of slides and then we'll go to the questions from our audience. So, oh, by the way, audience, um, please put your questions in the Q&A section. I mentioned this at the beginning. You can also give a question a thumbs up, which helps to move it to the top of the queue. It's called upvoting or um, add your own questions there so that we can see them. And we'll answer uh, questions in a couple of moments. I just want to let everybody know that next week, August 28th, we have a fellow spotlight and it's sponsored by the generosity of Tom Wagner. We have Guillaume Teasdale, who was our 2009 Price Fellow, and Andrew Sturtevant, uh, who was a 2014 Upton Fellow, talking about French and Native Americans in early Detroit. And as Jonathan mentioned, Guillaume will be talking about his book, Fruit to Perseverance, as part of that. So we're really looking forward to that discussion. Um, please remember, too, that we uh, didn't know how long we'd continue the bookworm when we first started it, and we've been delighted with the wonderful audience and um, camaraderie that we have had. So this will be our last weekly episode, 
And then starting in September, we will move to a monthly episode for the bookworm because we're going to also do some of our other virtual programming. So you'll, you'll see an email with some more information about some of the lectures and discover series that we will uh, be providing in addition to the bookworm. So after August 28th, the next bookworm will be September 18th. And it'll be a collector's corner episode with sheet music collector Kevin Hugh Lynch. Um, so that should be really fun. I also want to remind everybody that um, we talked a lot about digitization today and moving programs online, which, as you can imagine, does indeed uh, take funds that some of us weren't expecting to be using in that way. So if you don't already um, support the Clements Library, we'd love to have you join, join us as a Clements Library associate and support our efforts. Uh, in addition, we are looking for sponsors for upcoming episodes of the Bookworm as well. All right. I think we're ready to go back to our Q&A section. So please put your questions in the Q&A. And I'm going to open that up and see what we have. Okay. Tom Wagner is asking, I'm assuming this is for Jonathan, were Detroit and Windsor perceived as one city under the French and English? So I wouldn't use the term city. I, I would say they're part of one unified community. Um, so Detroit is originally, where Detroit stands today is the original focus point. That's where the fort is established, the palisaded walls are built. Uh, and then, and that's in 1701. And then in the years and decades thereafter, settlement expands. So eventually people start moving to the Southern side around, around 1740. Uh, that's when the Huron mission is established there. But I mean, throughout the period, Detroit is, Detroit today, uh, is the central location of the city, the, cent the central point for commerce, culture, uh, and governance. That's where the garrisons are, that's where imperial officials stay, uh, and that's where St. Anne de Detroit is, so that's the main Catholic parish in the region. Um, so yeah, it's considered one unified settlement. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Tom is also asking, today there's a great deal of discussion about the origins of armed English settlers in North America. Were the early settlers armed and was it a recognized right? I'm not sure if any of you are studying that particularly. I think that's a question for Zach, as uh, the 17th century. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a question I was told by a law professor at Stanford never to answer. Um, whatever you say, it's going to be not what they want to hear. Um, that's a really complicated question. Um, so I can direct you to some resources. Uh, part of the underlying problem with the question is um, what, what defines who owns what. Um, so part of the concept that we're familiar with, with of the Minuteman, they had the guns in the house because they took it out of the armory. Um, so if you're interested in this, look at John Shy's work, A People Numerous and Armed, um, but also Michigan law professor Bill Novak um, in his book, The People's Welfare, has a whole section about the regulation of powder houses and armories um, in early North American cities. Um, there's a reason that these houses, these uh, buildings rather, exist at places like Williamsburg. And if you go there, you'll notice that they're far away from the center of town. The reason being, if you kept the powder in the center of town and it exploded, the whole town would catch on fire. Um, so there's some debate about who owns what, uh, they, some people had guns, some people didn't have guns. The concept of a right is different in the 17th century than it is in the 20th century. Um, so there are armed settlers, uh, they do use guns to protect themselves, whether or not it's a right seems to be up for debate. Thank you. Thanks for those resources too. All right. Paul's asking, I'm wondering if each of the three panelists could talk about how they arrived at their dissertation projects. Did you start with a question you want to examine and then go looking for archives that would support the inquiry? Or did you begin with an awareness of what sources existed and then develop a project that could be developed out of those materials? 
Hunter, do you want to go first since? Uh... Yeah, sure. I'll um, lead off here. So um, my project kind of happened. Uh, I don't want to say totally by accident, but it wasn't. Um, it wasn't planned well in advance. I was doing my reading for our qualifying exams in the PhD program, and I was coming across references to these well-articulated systems of merchant courts in the French and Spanish empires. And I thought that was really interesting and curious, particularly because I had never heard of anything like that in the British empire. Uh, so then I started looking into the question of how did British merchants resolve their disputes? And that um, kind of snowballed from a study of arbitration into a study of merchants and the law. And then I had to figure out how to um, actually go about answering this question, which is when I picked the three cities. So I, I guess I started with the question and then worked towards the archives rather than the other way around. For myself, um, like I mentioned, uh, I grew up relatively local. I was very interested in the history of this period, the history of the particular region. Um, New Michigan would be a great place to that. Or for that, knew there was a lot of archival material at nearby repositories. Didn't really have questions finally developed as I entered the program. I knew I wanted to look at this borderlands angle. Um, but, you know, you work and you develop that over time with professors and with advisors. And there's a lot of what's called borderlands literature. So on the southwest border, U.S.-Mexico border, um, Scholars have really devoted a lot of attention to that, people, goods, moving, the formation of that area, the formation of that border. So I'm relying on a lot of that scholarship um, to you know, develop questions about what's happening on the northern border. So this, for me, was something that the questions in the particular re research focus grew out of my interest in the period, in the history, um, and working closely with my advisors as well. Thanks. How about you, Zach? Um, so I came to Michigan thinking I was going to write a dissertation on the development of lighthouses um, in early America. Um, and one of the, the problems um, that you have with the dissertation is you don't have an infinite amount of time to go out and do the research. Um, and as I was doing the pre-research on where archives are held and stuff like that, I quickly realized it was a 10 to 15 year project uh, and could not get done in the three years I had to write the dissertation. Um, so over the course of my coursework, I had been collecting a list of questions, and I think I had about 10 of them. Um, by the time it came to me to write my prospectus, which is the thing that you write the proposal for the dissertation. Um, and I sat down with uh, Dr. Hancock, and we went through the list, and we talked about what was doable and what would make you more marketable. Um, and I figured, if nothing else, uh, I could go on TV and talk about how we misunderstand Thanksgiving every year, uh, every November. So. Um, I ended up writing a dissertation on uh, the pilgrims and I had had this question about legal development um, for a long time. Uh, so it just sort of all fell together in a way that um, hopefully I'll be able to finish my dissertation soon and uh, go out and get a job. So that's how I came to my dissertation. Nice. Thank you. Are you still thinking that someday you'll work on the Lighthouse Project? Uh, yes, hopefully. Um, if I'm able to get a job that supports that kind of research, uh, I would like to come back to it. It's definitely a whole um, in our understanding of the early American state. If you have a lighthouse, you have to go out uh, and buy the land, you have to develop the land, you have to pay a lighthouse keeper. Um, and for people who are on the periphery of the American state, they're not having a whole lot of uh, interaction with the government. This is an era before income tax. Um, so, you know, they're relating to the government through the land office, the militia, uh, all sorts of things that we don't really think about as part of our everyday lives, or at least as somebody growing up in suburban Chicago, I didn't think about. Um, so it could be a really interesting way of sort of getting at that question about American identity building and, and uh, government development. Oh, definitely, definitely. I love visiting lighthouses and hearing about their history, so. All right. Let's see. <clears throat> All right, Christina says, are the panelists intending to pursue faculty positions or otherwise continuing work in academia following their PhDs? If not, what professions are you interested in? All right, Hunter must have thought about this. Sorry, Hunter, I'm gonna pick on you to go uh, over again. 
You, you, I, I've thought about it. Um, actually, my project for the rest of today after we're done with this is to work on an application for a postdoc position. Um, so I will be applying to some academic jobs. Uh, as some people probably know, it's not a um, great time for the humanities. Uh, COVID has made that worse. So um, I'm not sure what I'll be doing when I finish. What do you think, Zach, Jonathan? Um, I have gone out of my way to build a, a very um, a diverse uh, CV, um, museum work, uh, policy work, uh, history, research. Um, so I'm just sort of seeing how it goes. I like to teach. Um, I think it's fun. Um, I think it's interesting developing classes and seeing, uh, getting students to think about how things have changed over time and how their own thoughts on things have changed over time. Um, but as Hunter said, there are very few jobs right now. Um, so you sort of have to uh, win the lottery. Um, so I'm just sort of keeping it open and, and seeing what happens. Okay. Yeah, I think that that's my mindset as well. I think for a lot of us that, you know, enter a PhD program, it's very much focused on thinking about kind of the tenure track position, you know, ideally teaching our subjects of interest. I think that's what we're all kind of aiming for. And it's true for me as well. Um, but, you know, thankfully, departments have recognized um, the need to kind of have discussions about career diversity with a lot of PhD students um, because of the job market, you know, even pre-COVID job market issues uh, that Zach and Hunter brought up. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, again, still focused on that kind of tenure track position, um, but, you know, definitely open to and interested in kind of other other opportunities in adjacent adjacent fields, for sure. Right, and I, I've seen a lot of, um, you know, good, uh, good programs through LSA history, uh, broadening the, the um, public history uh, exposure that that graduate students have, which I think is lovely, you know, Hence, mm -hmm. hence the internship at the Clemens Library. Right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. All right. Tom is saying the 1764 map doesn't seem to show the French long lot farms off the Detroit River. Why? Right. Yeah, that's a very good observation. And it's, it's a question that I, I don't have an answer for. It's a very puzzling aspect or feature of that map. So what Tom's referring to is during the, the period of French colonization, um, pre-roads, pre-development of travel infrastructure, it's going to be rivers that are going to be essentially like highways, the main, um, main means of communication, travel. Um, so as in the French colonial system in North America, they divide up as they're issuing land parcels to colonists, to settlers, they have very oblong shaped very long rectangular pieces of land that front on a river. So the Detroit River, for example, um, and they would be running north south in relation to the Detroit River, the map um, that's in the Clements Library and that was included earlier from 1764 of Detroit has these odd rectangular and square shaped farms, which uh, is not what, um, not true to form as they would have looked at that time. So it's definitely um, a puzzling, puzzling element of that map that Tom noticed. Yeah. Right. All right, thank you. Um, I am going to read the next one just so that um, people hear the answer to it in, in case they're not seeing the answer. But Cheryl's at, um, commenting that she's noticed that the Tellier papers are mentioned in multiple Clements presentations and wondering when and how the Clements acquired them. And so Jane is answering, Jane Ptolemy, that the bulk of the collection was purchased in 2002 with some additional material in 2012. It's a large and rich collection, which um, is indeed true. All right, so uh, Tom has a lot of questions this morning. He's also asking, did many of the British officials and military officers have personal or household slaves? Um, uh, define many. Um, some of them yeah. did, some of them didn't. This is a complicated question about uh, slavery in the British Empire. Um, 
the official answer is that after 1772, there are no slaves in the or in England itself on the on the Isle of Britain. Um, that's the Somerset v. Stewart decision. Um, but people who were serving in uh, the Caribbean and in other places, uh, slaves were acquired, moved around, passed along. Um, but it becomes a pretty contentious uh, political point uh, the longer the American Revolution uh, goes on um, to the point where people um, or officers rather without authorization uh, are freeing slaves. Uh, and if you are a self-liberating slave and you made it to a British vessel, a lot of times they wouldn't turn you back over uh, to the Americans. Um, so uh, it just sort of depends on the officer. There's no sort of blanket uh, question or sort mm -hmm. of blanket answer. I think it might also have to do with, you know, their, their means and their status, whether they would have had the money to acquire a slave in their, whichever posting they were, foreign posting they were, you know. Right. Plus they can boss around all of the, uh, all their subor subordinates, right? The right. right. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll complicate that a little bit. And there's been some new research that's shown that slavery, um, or at least the presence of enslaved people continued in Britain even after the um, Somerset decision. Um, Simon Newman at the University of Glasgow has done a big project about runaway slaves in Britain and particularly Scotland. And there's, um, there's a distinction between the ways that English and Scots law treats um, slavery. And so it's um, like everything else, it's more complicated than at first glance it would seem. Right, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, Tom is asking, how important was Detroit to the international fur trade and when um, did it decline? Um, I mean, Detroit is a very prominent fur trade entrepot settlement and it's, it's designed, it's, it's established with that purpose in mind. Um, I think by 1796, when it becomes, uh, when the border is established and it it becomes by virtue of that more of a kind of an international location or a borderlands location. I think by 1796, the fur trade had already started to shift west fairly considerably. So it's in places like Grand Portage. It's, it's moving into Minnesota and Wisconsin areas um, because, you know, with a, a for-profit or a market, market-based fur trade taking place already in Michigan, what's, what becomes Michigan for five, six decades is already pretty, pretty significant depletion of say beaver stocks and, and other fur bearing animals. So by 1796, um, it's really started to shift west and then you have the American Fur Company emerging later um, and there's a general westward push uh, around that time. Thank you. Yeah. Dyke Benjamin is asking, how have the French English language in the Ontario tract since 1796? Um, so Ontario, it's a great question. Um, Ontario has a relatively small French speaking population. It's concentrated in Northern Ontario. And um, of course, you know, for, for historical reasons, also in the, the far Southern extreme, which is more or less close to Detroit. So it's in the counties near to Detroit in Southern Ontario. And those counties have fairly high French speaking population as well, which is of course a, a remnant from, from this early period of colonization. And parts of Michigan as well. Yeah, so French town, Monroe, those regions. Um, but it's certainly more, uh, more evident on the Canadian side, French speakers. All right, thanks. Um, Tom is asking, do you discover that current publications sometimes misinterpret or distort original documents? Zach's uh, laughing, Hunter's laughing. Sure, I mean, I, th I think things like that happen uh, very frequently. Um, the, the thing that's coming to my mind, uh, the top of my mind is the article, it was in the New York Times a few weeks ago about um, a study that some geneticists at 23andMe had done about um, African-American populations and tracing ancestry from Africa. And it was trying to talk about using that as a resource to understand the Atlantic slave trade and where African captives came from. And um, it had a most 
basic understanding of the uh, slave trade. I was talking to a good friend who, who studies that in more detail than I do. And we both were just kind of shaking our heads saying that if only they talked to a historian that knew anything about this, it um, could have saved them a lot of time and effort. Maybe they could have said something interesting because it was a lot of no new news. Mm -hmm. Zach, do you have another example uh, that you're thinking of? Yeah, I, um, I think this is a product of the speed at which historians operate. Um, the articles that Hunter is talking about, right, those get published really fast. And op-eds uh, in the Washington Post and other places uh, get published very, very fast. And you have to be a particularly advanced scholar who has read a bunch of stuff to do that type of thing very well. Um, and so sometimes things get like left out or, or moved around in the margins or just cut by the editor without telling the author. Um, but the thing that comes to mind for me is Hamilton, um, the musical. Uh, so Hamilton, when it came out, visit to uh, Hamilton's uh, mansion in New York, the Grange, went up by something like 80%. And there's no book that could do that, right? We were talking earlier about sort of the gateway to history mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of the questions that we develop as young scholars are come out of these poorly or less well-written or misinterpreted things. Um, and I wanna say that like uh, people with PhDs misinterpret documents all the time. It's not just a thing that happened um, to people without them. Um, but people distort original documents for all sorts of reasons. Um, when Merrick Garland was up for uh, the U.S. Supreme Court seat. Um, uh, Cory Booker, who is a well-educated uh, Stanford, I think Princeton graduate, um, said that the founders originally wanted nine justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, well, if you go to the original document, the, the sorry, the Judiciary Act of 1787, um, they clearly list six, right? Like this happens all the time and it happens for all sorts of reasons. Some are intentional and some are not. Um, and sometimes it just happens off the cuff and then we all look really embarrassed. So, um, yeah, people do it. Um, I try to avoid it. I, hopefully we all try to avoid it, but it, it happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this sort of leads into a discussion that we had had during the dress rehearsal that didn't really come up today. But, you know, you mentioned Hamilton. And so there is that gateway with movies and musicals and other popular culture to get people interested in history. But do you find it problematic then when they, when they get it wrong? Um, I mean, it, I guess it's, I guess it would depend on the degree of the hi historical, you know, inaccuracy. Uh, it's kind of a joke in my family that, you know, it's hard for, hard for me to kind of like watch a movie and not point out when something you know, is inaccurate or it's different than what we had read, right? You, I used to be that way. Um, I don't know, you know, it can, it can be a great story um, as long as it's, you know, we have to understand, like, I guess the different audiences that, the, that these projects are, are intended for. Um, yeah. Mm. Anyone else? Because, uh, Hamilton's such a good example of how to get somebody interested, though. My my daughter, when she was in, let's see, were they in third or fourth grade at the time? She and her friends would, like, perform Hamilton during recess. So she would be at home on her Kindle, like, memorizing the words for the next day's performance. She'd be like, tomorrow, I'm Lafayette. And she'd be... <laughs> memorizing but then it did lead her to actually read more and learn more about Hamilton too you know more um, so it is a fascinating you know kind of leads back to what we were talking to about before we started the official program mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. does anyone have a favorite movie uh, that's historically based I mean, I think we, we brought it up the other day, but uh, I, I'm a fan of Master and Commander with uh, Russell Crowe. Um, it's, I think it's a good movie and I enjoy it. I was watching it just the other week. Uh, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's up there for me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Horatio Hornblower is a great series. Oh, so good. Um, obviously, you know, based on a series of books, but uh, published by or put out by a British um, production company. 
Uh, there's also Poldark on PBS. I'm a, I'm a big fan of. I don't know if you guys have come across that. And the Patriot I mentioned earlier as well. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also a big fan of those things. Um, uh, we, we all have very similar research interests, so I guess that makes right. sense. Um, I, I would always recommend Gettysburg if you have six hours to burn in your day. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure how historically accurate it is, but it is. It is well done and much better than gods and generals, um, in terms of the, the propaganda behind it. So, um, if you do have six hours, I'd, I'd recommend checking that out. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Barbara is asking, Jonathan, did you do any research in the Detroit libraries or museums? So uh, I, the Burton Historical Collection of the Detroit Public Library is a really, really great resource, um, especially on the colonial era, especially on even through like 20th century, uh, 20th century Detroit. Um, it's a great resource, um, though I think a little bit uh, not as widely known, I would say. Uh, and then I've also looked at the uh, Monroe County Historical Museum and Archives, uh, a little further south in Monroe. Those are the, the local archives of I visited. Thank you. Thanks. It looks like we have finished with questions. Do any of you have any questions for each other or any last comments before we go? I don't know, Hunter, you're about to graduate. You got any wisdom for yeah. the uh, rest of us? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, Always be writing. I guess you know it's it's a lot easier to um, always be in the process of like writing your dissertation, writing up notes, a little like a memoirs about a person or a thing as you go along, rather than saying, "Oh, I'll come back to that when I've mm -hmm. you know when I finish this chunk of research and I come to write the chapter about this." And then you go and look at all of your notes, um, write it up as you go along, okay. uh, and, yeah. and um, make sure you take really good notes where you find stuff from. Uh, always write down the page number because otherwise you will be told that your footnotes are not precise enough. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. let me get back to you in a couple weeks or a month. When right, I, right. And I should have done better. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions to end with? Uh, just thanks for, thanks for inviting us. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Hunter, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I'm not, not quite there yet, but uh, I'll let you know when it's over the line. Yeah. yeah. That's great. great. So thank you so much for sharing um, your research and your, um, you know, all of this good information about what it's like to um, pursue a graduate degree in history. It was really a great conversation today. I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. And thank you everybody who joined us today and have a great weekend. Thanks very much. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.